Okay, wel welcome everyone. Um, this mic doesn't sound like it's working, but it actually is for, for the live stream. Um, Professor Budzhevsky's mic will be working for both the live stream and the house sound, but we could only get one house speaker's mic working, so he's got it. Um, so having said that, on behalf of both First Things Magazine uh, and the Austin Institute, I'd like to welcome you here this evening. Uh, my name is Kevin Stewart. I'm the executive director of the Austin Institute. Our mission is threefold. One, to support original social science research. Two, to help bridge the divide between the ivory tower and the public square. And three, to invigorate campus life through innovative programming in and around the University of Texas at Austin. Um, tonight, we have actually an example of all three in that this is a program um, which will help make academic work that Professor Budzhevsky has done accessible to non-specialists in the public. So it's really a great example of all three and we're very proud to partner with um, First Things on this event. Uh, we are being uh, live streamed, so there will be a Q&A period afterwards. So as you think of great questions, make a mental note or an actual note, there will be a Q&A period that um, the Austin Institute's Associate Director, Dr. Deanne Stewart, will, will be the host for that. She will have this mic, and even though it doesn't sound like it's coming through the speakers, please do wait on it so that those watching online can hear the question that you, that you asked. Also, there will be a sign-in sheet coming around. This is so people, this helps us help people vote with their feet about what sorts of programming the, that we offer. So it helps us know how many people were here, um, and if you'll put your email address on there, there's a spot for that. We will add you to our email list. We promise not to sell your email address to anyone and also not to spam your email box. You'll get about one a month uh, from us. Um, so now on to the business at hand. Tonight, I have a very distinct pleasure. I get to introduce a scholar whom I greatly admire, a writer whose combination of clarity and depth we should all emulate, perhaps the leading thinker on conscience, and a man who was my teacher for nearly a decade. Jay Budzhevsky is a professor of government and philosophy at the University of Texas at Austin and received his PhD from Yale in 1981. His area of specialization is the natural moral law. And he is most well known for his work on moral self-deception, the revenge of conscience. What happens when we tell ourselves that we don't know what we really do know? His interests include virtually everything at the intersection of ethics and politics, from both a philosophical and a theological point of view. And he has written about such topics as moral character, family and sexuality, religion and public life, authentic versus counterfeit versions of toleration and liberty, and the unraveling of our common culture. Dr. Budzhevsky has published widely, not only in professional journals, but also in periodicals of broader readership, such as our co-sponsor tonight, First Things. The most recent of his 12 books are his commentary on Thomas Aquinas' treatise on law and on the meaning of sex. His commentary on Thomas Aquinas' virtue ethics is just out from Cambridge University Press. His works also include three books for students, most notably, How to Stay Christian in College. And he maintains a website and blog called The Underground Thomist. So he's a very busy man. Tonight, he will revisit some of his most read essays from the past. In, the, in this period of ideological and political party flux, Jay's thoughts from 21 years ago are suddenly even more relevant than they were when first written. And so without further delay, Jay Budzhevsky. I'm so glad to be speaking to all of you tonight as I, was, as I was waiting for the event to begin. I recognized a number of former students and, uh, and other people whom I've met around Austin and the community over the years. And as I'm looking out, as you know, I see some other people whom I've met and uh, didn't recognize when I was down at ground level. You have to be up high before you can see. So I greet you too. Also, welcome to the people who are watching on video on the stream. That's uh, really terrific. Now, I have been asked, as you just heard, to speak about what a genuinely Christian view of politics would entail. That is a tall order. If you don't think so, reflect for a moment. It would have to hold the highest ideals and yet without supposing that we can build a utopia. 
He would have to cherish cooperation in the earthly common good, yet without forgetting that our true commonwealth is in heaven. It would have to resist those faddish enthusiasms which steal the name of justice, and yet it would have to patiently seek true justice for all people. Instead of proclaiming conservative nostrums like mourning in America or liberal nostrums like the New Deal and all the other deals that followed it, it would have to propose the cardinal virtues, the Decalogue, and the overarching need for God's grace. It would be a discipline, not an emotional excitement. As I say, a tall order, a dauntingly tall order. At least I'm daunted and I'm almost ashamed to speak of such things with you because so much has been said about them over the years by so many great minds. Who am I? And yet, with all of that thought, with all of that tradition, how lightly Christians take, tend to take the treasures of their own heritage of thought about these matters. For example, an excellent set of political principles is found in the social doctrine of the Catholic Church. Yet, even the Church doesn't do a very good job teaching them, and sometimes even seems to be embarrassed by them. For example, it's not helpful when the representatives of the Church speak about international violence in ways that almost imply that to be a Christian you have to be a pacifist, when in fact Catholic social doctrine teaches the possibility of just war, and in some cases its necessity for maintaining a justly ordered peace. And when was the last time you heard a homily or a catechetical talk about the principle of subsidiarity which states that whenever possible the necessary tasks of social life should be carried on at the lowest level possible, respecting natural institutions such as the family, and that the government should not to seek to take over their tasks or to absorb them. Now to forget all of this, whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Jewish or whatever, and to drift off and become captured by contemporary ideologies is so tempting. It was the thought of that temptation that motivated me, lo these many years ago, to write a pair of the articles for First Things, which Kevin mentioned in his introduction, one called The Problem with Liberalism, one called The Problem with Conservatism. Now that was in olden times, the 20th century, when college professors still lived in trees, journalists were still widely respected, liberals still believed in free speech, Conservatives still believed in civility. Fewer chuckles there. <laughs> and it was still possible to speak of something called Western civilization without being accused of racism and other odious vices. Last year, a couple of comedians, as by now you know, at the Austin Institute thought that it would be amusing to dig me up from my unquiet grave and clean me up a little and uh, ask me to reflect on the problems with liberalism and conservatism today. They talked first things into sponsoring the lecture, and here I am. I may as well let you know now that whether you're liberal or conservative, you may be seriously annoyed with me before I finish. <laughs> Some of the things that I have to say this evening will not be easy to hear, uh, even if they're true. <laughs> and what if they're not true? Anything that I say may be mistaken. If I know anything at all about my subject, it's not because I've never made errors myself, even though I'll be talking about errors of other people. It's, if I know anything about my subject, it's rather because I have been caught in so many of my own errors, and I've learned something from the experience of being caught in them, even if I haven't learned enough. So maybe this fact will also make it a little easier to bear with me when I express moral judgments, which I will, I'll try to follow Christ's command to judge with right judgment. But as the psalmist says, I know my transgressions. Now, although every courteous person is welcome here, both of the original articles were written from a Christian point of view, explicitly so, and both were motivated by the misadventures of my own political biography. You see, believers in the congregation of my youth took for granted that Christianity and liberal politics were... Uh, opposed to each other. The Bible seemed to back them up. Of Lyndon Johnson's two great wars, for instance, the war in Vietnam and 
the war against poverty, they viewed his war in Vietnam with enthusiasm because they thought America is a city on a hill. Now that's a term that Jesus Christ had, had applied to his followers. While viewing his war on poverty with indifference because, as Jesus remarked, you always have the poor with you. Well, as an anti-war socialist in those days, I rebelled and I eventually I left the faith. Uh, and in fact, I left more than the faith. I left moral sanity altogether, completely. Uh, when in middle adulthood I returned to Christian faith, I then found myself in a congregation of a very different kind. Here, here to my surprise, the believers took for granted that Christianity and liberal politics were bosom brothers that they were almost the same thing. And again, scripture was gleaned for support. As you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Obvious backing for the welfare state. There is neither male nor female, for you're all one in Jesus Christ. A manifesto for feminism, of course, and now we would say transgenderism and who knows what else. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Pansexual activists ask for no more. As a teenager, I'd hurled some of the same verses against my own elders, so God had devised a cunning penance. Now, of course, both sides were tearing passages out of context and reading into them things that are not there. I've written about that. It's, I call it projective accommodation. It's one of the favorite modes of, of religious discourse. But unfortunately, knowing that this is so, doesn't answer the ideological question, does it? It doesn't answer the question, is it even possible for Christians to be full-blooded liberals or full-blooded conservatives with no compromise to their faith? I thought then, and I think now, that each of these ideologies, liberalism and conservatism, is a bundle of acute moral errors with political consequences that grow more and more alarming as these errors are taken closer and closer to their logical conclusions. I didn't claim that any liberal commits all of the liberal errors or that any conservative commits all of the conservative ones. In fact, it would be impossible to do so because some of the errors actually contradict some of the other errors. Uh, you couldn't hold all of the conservative errors at the same time or all of the liberal ones. But I did think that these errors were common, that they were so common as to be characteristic of the respective ideologies in which I'd found them. Consequently, although I thought Christians could at times be in tactical alliance with the liberals or conservatives, I didn't think that they could be in strategic alliance with them. In other words, from time to time, authentic Christians might seek to advance some liberal proposal or conservative proposal, but they should not seek to advance, advance fundamental liberal or conservative errors. Well, as you might guess, the original pair of articles aroused some curious reactions. For years, Liberals wrote to me for permission to reprint the article about the problem with conservatism. And conservatives wrote to me for permission to reprint the one about the problem with liberalism. My response was always the same. I said, you may reprint the one you like, but only if you reprint the other one too. Horrified, they always declined. They always declined. Each side recognized by portrait of the other guy, but not my portrait of himself. Another amusing thing happened at a conference where a scholar responded to my two articles. He's a highly intelligent man whom I still know and whom I like very much. He may be listening by streaming, uh, by streaming video tonight. Uh, but he adheres to a certain school of textual interpretation, a certain way of reading things that, in my opinion, looks too hard for hidden meanings. And he thought that he had found some in my two articles. Since I had listed nine <laughs> acute moral arrows in the article on liberalism, but only eight of them in the article on conservatism, 
he thought, well, okay. Nine is an odd number. So right between um, the first four and the last four, that's the central one that tells the meaning, that's the key to the whole critique of liberalism. He said, but where's the central one that would give the key to the critique of liberalism? Eight is an even number. So he drew the entirely mistaken conclusion that in the critique of conservatism, I must have been hinting that the most important thing that I wanted to say about conservatism was hidden. Right in the middle, between the lines of errors four and five. Now, why would I hide it? Because he said, it's one of those things that must never be openly stated. And he then proceeded to tell the audience what he took it to be. <laughs> well, enough of the comedy hour. I'm afraid I wouldn't succeed on 6th Street, but what are these great moral errors of liberalism and conservatism? In case you're worried, <laughs> I think so too, that it would be tedious to run through each of them. And I'm not going to. I actually did in the first draft of this talk <laughs> and realized that that was, uh, that was going nowhere. But I will mention just a few. I think I have to because I can't simply assume that everybody's read the two previous articles. One common liberal error is propitiationism, as I called it. Propitiationism, according to this view, I should propitiate people. I should do unto others as they desire. And according to Christianity, I should do unto others as they need. Another is expropriationism, as I called it, expropriationism. According to this view, I may take from others to help the needy, even giving nothing of my own. But according to Christianity, I should give of my own to help the needy, taking from no one. Let's end with what I call the fallacy of desperate gestures. You know, some people try to relieve the pain of others, right? Right? That's good. By contrast, the desperationist acts to relieve his own pain. It may be the pain of pity, the pain of beholding their pain, the pain of indignation. He's like a man who beats on a misbehaving television with a pipe wrench, not because the wrench will fix the problem, but because it's handy and it feels so good to use. Don't tell me that my anti-poverty pol policies are hurting poor families. We can't just do nothing. That's a desperate gesture. We have to do something, even if it hurts, even if it makes it worse, even if it guarantees generation after generation in this pain. By contrast, the eyes of Christians are lifted up not to the spectacular idol of political salvation, but to the cross. Turning to the other side, a common conservative error is civil religionism. It has a long history. I, I teach about religion and politics in American political thought. I can trace it for you all the way back to the pilgrims, if you like, right through the 19th century and through the 20th. But according to this notion, America is a chosen nation. Not Israel. America is a chosen, well, or in addition to Israel, and its projects are a proper focus of religious aspiration. By contrast, according to Christianity, America is but one nation among many, no less loved by God, but no more. However, we may love her, dote upon her, and sometimes regret her, the Lord our God can do without the United States. Another error is, I called it mammonism. Mammonism, according to this notion, the continual increase of wealth is the object of commonwealth. Get that growth rate up. Get that GNP up there. According to Christianity, wealth is not in itself evil, but wealth beyond necessity is a snare and a temptation, and its continual increase is even worse because it makes us tend to rely on what we have instead of on the Almighty. As everyone really knows, mammonism is the real meaning of the so-called big tent. Keep your mouth shut about abortion, man. Don't say too much about that. You might put the capital gains tax cut at risk. This time I'll end with meritism. Meritism. According to this notion, I should do unto others as they deserve. 
Well, there is a place for consideration of dessert in social life, but it is not the only consideration. Christianity teaches that in what we need most of all, we are helpless. The grace of God is an undeserved gift. I should take as the fixed law of my action not what others desire, that's the propitiationist fallacy that liberals commit, not what others deserve, which is the meritist fallacy that conservatives often commit, but what they need. Always remembering, of course, that they have not only bodily needs but moral needs, including the need to be held responsible for their actions. Class, there will be a quiz tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. Well, of course, there won't really be a quiz. Besides, if there were one, I might do poorly on it too. Because my thinking about the 17 errors, the 9 and the 8, has changed since 1995. Though from time to time I think that I left a few out, I still think that all these errors are errors. I still think that liberals and conservatives do commit them. But now in 2017, I suspect that I exaggerated the liberal pedigree of what at that time I called the liberal errors, and that I exaggerated the conservative pedigree of what at that time I called the conservative errors. For example, in my original articles, I described only one of the articles, which I called, uh, one of the errors, excuse me, which I called neutralism, as having both liberal and conservative varieties. What I said at that, although pr at present the liberal version is more dangerous because it is the liberals who control the higher reaches of our culture, the liberal version of neutralism cries, coexist, don't judge, on the supposed grounds that morality and all considerations of good and evil are really relative. The conservative version of neutralism cries, leave me alone, on the supposed grounds that everybody ought to mind his own business. By contrast, although he agrees that everyone ought to mind his own business, St. Paul warns three times against busybodies. I was amazed to find that. Christianity holds that unless our moral and religious judgments are sound, we won't even be able to discern correctly what our own business is. It's not neutral to say what your own business is and what somebody else is. Moreover, all laws whatsoever rest on moral judgments. All laws whatsoever. There are very influential conservative ideologies and very influential liberal ideologies, some of them taught here at our own law school, which, uh, which teach that uh, law doesn't have to rest on a moral judgment, that you can suspend judgment. But even the view that moral judgment itself is wrong and shouldn't be tolerated depends on a moral judgment. It says it's wrong. Even the view that moral judgment um, should not be uh, tolerated depends on a moral judgment. Neutrality among moral judgments is literally impossible. It is literally impossible. For example, sometimes people propose neutrality in the debates over marriage. They say, we have to suspend judgment here. We should be neutral between the view that marriage requires a man and a woman and the view that it doesn't require a man and a woman. Isn't that tolerant? But it, to demand neutrality between the view that it demands a man and a woman and the view that it doesn't demand, de, de, <clears throat> demand a man and a woman is in fact to promote the view that it doesn't. The only thing accomplished by the pretense of suspending judgment is actually to undermine the previous moral judgment and smuggle in a different moral judgment without having to argue for it, just by pretending that it isn't a moral judgment. In our day, it is true that this particular hoax is perpetrated mostly by liberals as a way to silence conservative voices. And it works. I'm sure that you're all aware of the attempts at numerous colleges around the country to silence speech that isn't politically correct, attempts that are not only allowed but encouraged by thuggish liberal students faculty, and administrators. I'm sure you know how race-baiting and even violence have been cheered on by thuggish left-wing mayors, attorneys general, and even presidents. Yet how do conservatives respond? All too often, simply by becoming thuggish too. You see, they accept the neutralist premise that to make a moral judgment is to be a thug, to oppose political correctness is to be uncivil. And so they say, let us be thugs. 
to hell with civility. See, I can even say hell. But today I think that not just neutralism, but also some of the other errors come in both liberal and conservative versions. That was the only one in 1995 I thought came in both a liberal and conservative version. I don't think that anymore. Take, for instance, the one I called civil religionism. Oh, to be sure, civil religionism really is a very common attitude among conservatives. But liberals, and liberals do like to lambast them for it. You religious bigots. President Eisenhower famously remarked, our form of government has no sense unless it's founded in a deeply felt religious faith. And I don't care what it is. It has sometimes been claimed, um, because it was difficult to track that statement down, that it was an urban myth that he didn't really say it. But uh, one scholar finally did track it down. And yes, in fact, he did say it. <laughs> President Reagan applied the scriptural image of the city on a hill, not to the church in America, as the Puritans did, but to America as such. Its mission not to bear witness to the gospel, but to spread the nation's political and economic ideas without reference to the gospel. That's civil religionism, and it's rather shocking. What I missed in those days, though, was that there is an enormously potent liberal form of civil religionism, too. Perhaps even more potent than the conservative variety. You see, I had defined civil religionism too narrowly, and I should have known better. I said a few moments ago that the way I defined it previously was that it was the view that America is a chosen nation, and that the nation's projects are a proper focus of religious aspiration. But civil religionism isn't just about the nation. It's about politics in general. Years ago, at that time, I fancied myself a pro-life Democrat. I attended a Travis County Democratic meeting at which the minister who was asked to offer the prayer of invocation prayed, God, lead your party to victory. That was God's party. The other one, I guess, was the party of the devil. Stealing from Christ himself, Mr. Clinton in his day called his political program not the New Deal, not the Fair Deal, but the New Covenant. The New Covenant, and then misquoted the prophet Isaiah to support it. As he said in a convention speech, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what we can build. I hear from the laughter out there that many of you recognize the passage and how it doesn't go like that. <laughs> According to scripture, what no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and the heart of man is not conceived, isn't what we can build, but what God has prepared for those who love him. Now, I knew those things in 1995, but somehow I failed to connect the dots. I should have said civil religionism is an error on the right, and it's an error on the left. In recent times, the most extreme instance of liberal civil religionism has been the messianic presentation of Mr. Obama, who was certainly no conservative. Jesse Jackson said that the Obama nomination was so significant that I quote, another chapter could be added to the Bible to chronicle its significance. Now, maybe you think that's just a little bit of hyperbole, it's not typical. No. A contributor to the left-wing website Daily Kos said in reference to Mr. Obama, what if all the religious nuts were bashing the second coming of their Christ and didn't even know it? Numerous bloggers on the left wrote that Obama was, a couple of characteristic quotations, no ordinary man, and that he, quote, communicated godlike energy whenever they could. Photojournalists framed their shots in such a way as to make his head appear to be bathed in an aureole of light. At Bernice Young Elementary School in Burlington, New Jersey, teachers made up a song about him for the students to sing. Borrowing words from the traditional children's hymn, Jesus Loves the Little Children. At a gathering sponsored by the Gamaliel Foundation in Washington, D.C., the crowd chanted, 
not the traditional litany, hear our cry, O Lord, but hear our cry, Obama. It has been said by some critics that it's a bad recording, and that's not what, what they were really saying. I've listened to it. You can listen to it. I think it's still on YouTube. That is what they were saying. It would have been bad enough had the nominee merely failed to repudiate this idolatry. Instead, like Caesar Augustus, the first emperor to allow an altar to be dedicated to his genius, that means his spirit, he cultivated and basked in it. Predictably, no sooner was he elected that he began to use his messianic prestige for abominable purposes, for example, setting himself against freedom of conscience for medical workers, so that they could be coerced to participate in abortions. But I suppose idolatry has always involved human blood. Or take what I call the fallacy of desperate gestures. The error in reasoning that makes a person willing to do almost anything to end his own personal political misery, even if it's merely symbolic, even if it actually is likely to make things worse instead of better, even if it has been demonstrated to make things worse instead of better. In 1995, I called this a liberal error. But after the desperate behavior of conservatives during the recent presidential election, it can no longer be denied that it has become a conservative error too. During the race, the argument that I heard most often from my conservative friends was that in order to prevent a criminal from taking office, they had to vote for a sociopath. As they saw it, they were forced to choose between a wild card and a known evil. Now, a sociopath, if he is a sociopath, is a much wilder card than the usual sort. If voting for such a person is not a desperate gesture, then I don't know what is. Now, I've just suggested that some of the moral errors that I formerly called conservative are also cons committed by liberals, and that some of the moral errors I formerly called liberal are also committed by conservatives. And to me, that's disturbing. But there is one more thing that I would change in my old critique of liberalism and conservatism, because I left one crucial error out. Probably I left a lot of them out. I've thought so over the years, but one in particular, one really important error. Let's call it amoralism. The view that a bad man can be a good statesman. The view that a bad man can be a good statesman. On the contrary, part of being a good statesman is being a good man, and this is the Christian view too. If I had thought of including amoralism in my list of ideological errors, in 1995, I would then have branded it as exclusively a liberal error. After all, that was during the administration of Bill Clinton, who thought nothing of having a White House intern on her knees, giving him sexual service at the same time that he was on the telephone, discussing national security policy. Speaking of which, consider Mr. Clinton's contributions to the craft of political lying. Speaking of whom, I should say, we've all heard of the technique called the big lie. This is the technique according to which a great falsehood repeated over and over works even better than a small one because nobody can believe that you would tell such a whopper. So they think it must be true. Mr. Clinton's variation on the big lie worked by numbers instead of size. It wasn't that he made every lie as big as possible. It's that he lied about everything, no matter how small. If you lie about everything, no matter how small, nobody can believe that you would tell so many lies. The whistleblowers can't keep up with you. They exhaust themselves trying to do so, and eventually they've blown their whistles so many times that people think they must be the liars and that it's all partisan. 
by that time a few of your li- by the time that a few of your lies are found out the virtue of honesty itself has been so discredited that no one cares whether you're lying or not what i hear about this most commonly is they all do it in those days it was conservatives who blew the moral whistle and that's why i thought it was a liberal era in those days it was conservatives who blew the moral whistle they were not just prudes their argument was that a goat who could not even keep his vows to his wife could hardly be expected to keep his vows his promises to the electorate and i think that's a pretty convincing line of reasoning we often think every age seems to think that there is some one of the of the capital vices of the deadly vices that isn't really deadly in our age it seems to be sex we say you know what is that about but there are connections among the vices and there are connections among the virtues and you can't just you can't just commit one vice and not be affected in all of the other dimensions of your moral character moreover conservatives in those days insisted that a statesman's moral character is important not only because a good man will be more likely to do good things which i'm sure is true but also because a bad man even if he does good things will drag down the moral character of the entire citizenry by example and that that may be worse than any of the things he does well that view is gone with the wind isn't it consider the man whom conservatives supported in the recent election this was a man who seemed unable to hold any principle consistently except the principle of self promotion this was a man who made fun of cripples who said that american soldiers who were captured and tortured and yet refused to betray their country are not heroes because quote i like people who weren't captured a man who has boasted in conversation that because he is such a big star that's what he said he can do anything with women even grab their private parts and they let him do it although he promised to appoint judges who would uphold the constitution he didn't even know how many articles it contained on one occasion he threw out the figure 12 the number by the way is 7 i don't say that such a man will never keep a promise and in some senses although certainly not in all senses i hope his administration is successful i won't be disappointed if it is successful because of the failure of my predictions i'll be glad that what could have happened didn't happen my point is somewhat different if such a man ever does keep a promise it will not be because he believes in keeping promises rather it will be because for the time being it suits his interests to keep them and even in the unlikely event that the wind keeps blowing the right way and he keeps all of them he will drag down the moral level of the country in disagreement with this view some religious conservatives have gone so far as to say that mr trump is anointed by god a motto seen on posters in at least one political rally said thank you Lord Jesus for Donald Trump. Thank you Lord Jesus for Donald Trump. Many on the left mocked such posters because they considered it contemptible to believe in Lord Jesus. Now I don't consider it contemptible to believe in Lord Jesus, but I am distressed for another reason. Thank you Lord Jesus for a man who tells his interviewer that adultery is not a sin? Yes, he did say that. Who boasts that married women burn for him? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a man who publicly mocks the looks of an opposing candidate's wife. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a man who slurs the objectivity of a judge just because of the judge's race. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for a man who says that he is so good that he can't remember ever asking god for forgiveness for anything thank you lord jesus for a man who has done so much to lower the moral and intellectual level of public debate thank you lord jesus how blasphemous it isn't jesus fault 
Now, I'm no prophet, and I offer no prophecy. But I have a speculation to offer. According to Scripture, God chastises the nations, and he punishes those which forget him. You know, as late as Abraham Lincoln, who said in his second inaugural address, very short, but a a heroic piece of prose, that God had used the Civil War to chastise both North and South for the shared guilt of slavery. At least, in his days, some politicians still knew that. Perhaps then God has permitted the rise of politicians like the Clintons, Mr. Obama, and Mr. Trump to chastise both liberals and conservatives for their own shared sins, such as two generations of doing almost nothing about the killing of 50 million infants. Considering how we have coarsened our perceptions considering how we have muzzled our consciences, considering how we have murdered our mercy, why should the advent of such public persons surprise us? There will be more of them, have no doubt. The next wave will be even worse. Perhaps their burning march, I think of Sherman, perhaps their burning march through the institutions of the Republic will contribute to our repentance. I hope so. For if anything in politics is certain, it's this. A nation that cannot repent will never be truly great again. So yes, actually, I do thank Lord Jesus. I thank him for the jolt of this dreadful awakening. But I doubt that the thank you Jesus posters were expressing that kind of thanks. When I expressed some of these views online recently, I was taken to task by certain readers um, who asked how I dared to limit, quote-unquote, the power of the deity. One asked, can't an omnipotent God use even a bad man to bring about his good purposes? Well, of course. Of course. But it doesn't follow that we should support a bad man on the off chance that God might use him. Besides, we don't pray that God's will be done as it is in hell, although I assure you his will is done there too. We pray that it be done as it is in heaven. Another reader wrote to say that he could imagine Mr. Trump repenting of his corruptions, but he chastised me because he said he could not imagine Mrs. Clinton repenting of her own vices. Well, perhaps I'm swayed by my own memory of how much I've had to repent during my own life and of how much mercy I've personally been shown. For if it really comes down to imagination, I can imagine anyone repenting with the help of God's grace. It happens. But should political decisions really depend on how much we can imagine? Judgments must be based on what we can know and on what we do know. As these these remarks may suggest, since 1995, I've also come to realize something else about liberalism and conservatism, and that is that there's a greater problem in our politics than faulty ideology. I would say in the 90s I was beginning to shake myself out of this error. It's one of my own deepest errors. I tended to, look, I'm an academic. I tend to intellectualize things. I tend to think, if only you can get people to think straight, everything is going to be okay. There's an error, there's an error, there's an error. Fix them, fix them, fix them. No, there is a greater problem in our politics than faulty ideology, as dangerous as that is. I say this reluctantly because I know my own faults, but our greater problem lies in our character. During year five of the Clinton administration, just after the Monica Lewinsky scandal had broken, remember that? It seems so quaint now in comparison with uh, 
more recent political misdeeds. A young man was interviewed by one of those ro roving reporters, you know. They go around with a camera crew and a microphone around the streets, and they shove the microphone into somebody's place and say, Sir, would you answer a few questions? And they all get onto video when they're on the nightly news then. Um, he was interviewed. I know events like the Monica Lewinsky s scandal seem like the Bronze Age to many people, but after all, I am a Bronze Age man. <laughs> I'm quoting from memory now. The reporter asked, does the scandal affect your views of the president? The young man replied, yeah. It makes me like him more because it shows he's just like me. This fellow illustrates a fundamental problem of self-government. It's a fundamental problem. It's true in every age. Everybody who tries to design a republic or maintain a republic has to give thought to it. Don't get me wrong, thank God, the preservation of a republic does not depend on moral perfection. If it did, there could be no possible republic. Actually, above a fairly low threshold of moral and practical uh, wisdom, citizens prefer the wisest and most virtuous rulers that they can get. They even prefer people, if they can find them, who, are, who they consider to be wiser and of better character than themselves. As I say, that's what they do above a certain low level of moral virtue. Unfortunately, when citizens fall below that threshold, as this man had, then it flips. They begin to prefer rulers who are at least as bad as they are. They find this comforting. I suggest that a significant proportion of the voting public now falls below that threshold. And I suggest that we not hold our Puritan noses as we consider them, but look in our own hearts as well. In the first place, many people now view thugs, I have used that term, as politically useful. Obama, Trump, whoever. He may be a thug, they reason, but he's our thug. He will do what we want. In the second place, they don't see thugs as bad men. They view them as strong men because they boast and they bully, and they view them as smart men because they break the rules to get their way. In the third place, they find brutishness magnetic. We see this in private life too. Paradoxically, disturbingly, some women feel safer through association with men who abuse them. Some men feel more manly, more strong, through association with men who dominate them and use them. Unfortunately, the same drives operate in politics. The same drives operate in politics. We think of private virtue and public virtue. Well, you can distinguish analytically between private and public virtue, but in the human soul, they're connected. It's all one piece. Finally, they want a savior. If not a son of God, then a son or daughter of the devil. They hunger for someone who will rescue them from this world of troubles, as one voter said. For a machete, heavy and sharp enough to cut through all the dark vines in the jungle. Now, I believe that in politics, just as in the soul, the only cure for false saviors is the Savior, and that the only cure for sin is repentance and the grace of God. Before he calls time on the Republic, may the loving and merciful God grant us the humility to seek the right cures. Thank you. I'm grateful to all of you for your attention. And I would be glad to entertain your questions. Hi, uh, Hi. Thanks for the talk. Is, it, You're is this on? Okay. 
Um, I'm just wondering how, uh, how what you're saying translates, if at all, into a positive program of political philosophy. There are, there are others, I'm thinking especially of Alistair McIntyre, who's off, who've offered a similar um, critique yeah. of, the, of this, the, uh, the shared errors of liberalism and conservatism. And there are sort of a few competing visions for yeah. what ought to replace that. And it, I think one of the central questions is whether it will involve a reform of classical liberalism or a rejection of classical liberalism in favor of Aristotelianism or Thomism or Marxism or something along those lines. Yeah, I think that, in, to put it in a nutshell, what you're asking me is how do we get from here to there, and right? What there and what there is, yes, and what there is. Uh, and you're right to, to cite those various figures. Uh, Alistair McIntyre has even, in one respect, he's, um, he's, uh, he did something long before I did. He, I, I still have some hope for the survival of, of the Republic. Uh, Alistair McIntyre has held that the, um, the, um, the contemporary structure of the liberal regime is so corrupt, liberal here used in a word that in, in a sense that embraces conservatives too, that uh, as I understand him, he won't, even, he won't vote anymore. I think that that's too extreme, although I think that there are occasions when the alternatives are both so bad that the only reasonable vote that you can make is the vote that says neither of the above. Um, but how do you actually reform the republic? I, I am more and more skeptical that, that, that means of reform can be achieved in, uh, by political action alone. I, I don't think that a better platform, even one that contained no, no errors and none of the things that I've called moral errors, is going to do it by itself. Would people support it? Um, what happens, what, what, is, what is requisite is that, people, um, is that people in their communities, in their families, in their neighborhoods, in their, uh, in their friendships, cultivate and practice the virtues. Now, it would be wonderful if, if uh, a philosophy could bring that about, and I think that there is a difference between erroneous and, uh, and correct philosophies, and that can certainly help because you have to have a, a sound philosophical view of what virtue is, for instance. Uh, and a sound theological view. But having, but having a sound view of what virtue is is not going to bring virtue about. What, we, what there has to be is a change of heart. And even a change of heart by itself is not enough because people need to live in contexts in which they can encourage each other in virtue. Now, I mentioned at the very beginning of the talk the social doctrine of the Catholic Church, which has something to say about this. The, the best kept secret of Catholic social thought is the principle of subsidiarity, which I mentioned which says that uh, things should be done at the lowest possible level. It, reflect, it, it recognizes the reality of certain natural institutions, like the family and so forth, that uh, are not part of the state, and the health of which is requisite if the state is to, to have any chance of being a good state at all. And I think that what we need to do is pay more attention to them. So you might say virtue, be, virtue even for the republic, begins at home. Thank you, Dr. Bujaseski. It really reminded me of my class with you 10 years ago. Um, <laughs> I remember you in my class. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to follow up on um, what was said previously. My, my question is about um, communitarian alternative to political engagement. So previously you said that, that the way in which we respond to the impasse between liberalism and conservatism is to cultivate the virtues within a community. And as I see it, the biggest problem with this vision of communitarianism is that you can't actually sustain a community, even a community of virtuous practitioners, if you, are, um, if you mean to restrict it to merely a small minority or even a small sect. So sometimes it's called the Benedict Option, and it tends yeah. to lead to a kind of ghettoization of mm -hmm. faithful communities of virtuous practitioners. Yes, and yes. The, the problem here, of course, is that once you create a ghetto, then you always prey upon the imperious powers that can invade and control that ghetto. Oh, sure. So I want to know how would you respond to that, and how would you engage politically in a way that would be able to protect these virtuous practitioners? Yeah, um, I, this, this, uh, this may sound like a, like, a, uh, like a futile response because the first thing that I have to say is that I don't really know the answer to that problem. I agree with you that it's the problem. And I have, um, I have uh, entertained the same criticism of the so-called Benedict Option. People think, well, we have, to, we have to sort of hide out in the country. We have to go you know, live on farms or communes or, or in little communities by a monastery or something like that. Well, you know, if, if nothing else changes in the broader society, what's going to happen is that those little, that those little uh, villages and, and communes are going to be invaded. They're going to be invaded. They're going to be coerced. The consciences of the people in them are going to be violated. 
So, so one of the other things that that means is that while we're cultivating these virtues, we can't, I hope it doesn't sound like I'm contradicting what I, what I said to the previous gentleman, but it doesn't mean that we can ignore uh, what's going on in politics. While we're doing this, we have to continue to try to, try to fight a, a uh, rearguard battle in order to uh, secure protections for the liberty of conscience and so forth, to, uh, to promote the uh, principle of subsidiarity as, a, subsidiarity as a political principle, even if we can't do anything else in politics. Subsidiarity would go a long way. You know, it's like what doctors say. They say, if, you know, even if you don't know how to cure this disease, at least do no harm. And if we really believed in subsidiarity, if people in policy-making positions believed in subsidiarity, at least they would stop doing harm, and that the natural regenerative tendencies of uh, God's creation of human nature uh, in, con in cooperation with his grace can begin to operate. Does that help? Very good. Okay, thank you. Do you see a strong correlation between conservative political thought and conservative religious thought and vice versa, of course. And why do you think that is so if, in fact, you do see that? Um, in some ways, I do. It's certainly true that, uh, you know, there's been a rising tide of atheism, for instance, in religion, uh, in religious matters. When I began teaching at the University of Texas in 1981, I scarcely ever met a student who was an atheist. Now it's very, very common. Uh, I suspect that this isn't just because of ch shifts in the ideological current or shifts in the intellectual current, but I think it's because of things like the breakdown of the family. It's very hard to trust God the Father when your own dad wasn't there. And a lot of these, uh, mostly young men, have, are carrying around a lot of anger. Um, so there's a, lot more, uh, there's a lot more atheism, and it's mostly on the left. It's mostly on the left. There may be perversions of the understanding of God on the right, but actual atheism is on the left. Um, there is also uh, on, the, on the left um, a greater degree of antinomianism, the idea that liberty means getting to do as I please. The word autonomy, whatever it meant to Kant, you know, whatever, whatever connections it may have had with the more authentic notion of, uh, of, uh, of um, a healthy, well-formed conscience, uh, and its liberty to operate, you know, now basically, basically means no restrictions, no restrictions on me. I can make up the rules as I go along, which is deadly. That, um, that is less current on the right. You know, on the right, you're more likely to get bad rules rather than a resistance to rules. Um, so, there, so I guess the short answer is, yes, I do see a correlation between, um, say, religious uh, revisionism and political revisionism on the left and religious conservatism of some kinds and uh, political conservatism. But it's a pretty sloppy correlation and there aren't straight lines of, 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 of logical um, uh, compulsion between them. Other questions? Thank you again for your talk. I really enjoyed your discussion about the need for a savior, which made me think of Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor chapter, where he lays out uh, his vision of what men and women really want from a ruler. Uh, but my question more has to do with your discussion of amoralism, and specifically how it's tied to uh, the current president in many ways. But I think if you could comment on and not just being attached to individuals, but also to parties, and this goes back also to your idea of desperate political maneuvers, and the role that people weren't just voting for the president, for Donald Trump because he was a desperate last choice, but because people can't envision a world without the Republican Party as it's currently constructed. Oh, I understand. Yeah, I would, uh, look, I will, I, will, I, will, I will confess something that will make many people think that, I'm, that, that everything I said today was a lie, that I'm not really a critic of both liberalism and conservatism, because the Democratic Party is, is, pres is presently so deeply committed to, uh, to the preservation of abortion, that it would be very difficult for me to imagine ever voting for a, a Democratic candidate. On the other hand, it doesn't follow from that that I find it easy to vote for Republican candidates. I don't. And sometimes one, one I think, is going to have to say no in order to insist that we have better candidates. And um, 
If there are people who, I don't know about this kind of borough, I mean, I hear from time to time about people who consider themselves uh, uh, pro-life Democrats. They, they exist. I don't know how they cooperate in such a party structure. But if there are any ways to reform that, I would certainly like to see it. I would certainly like to see it. it it's, it's, uh, we, we, need, we, need multiple, uh, we need multiple parties. And uh, one of the difficulties, I think, connected with what you're talking about is this. I don't know that I would connect it with amoralism so much, the view that uh, a bad man can be a good person, but the view that having, having, having my ideology is the very definition of being a good person. You know, I don't eat meat, so I'm good, right? That kind of thing. Or, uh, or I do eat meat, and I'm not afraid of hunting an animal, so I'm good. I'm macho. Uh, I, uh, I knew a man once who thought that it was part of the very essence of Christianity, that he had to be a hunter. <laughs> Look, I'm not saying anything against hunting, but I think that that was going a little far. We do tend to, we do tend to have this group um, uh, loyalty with it, so that it's, it's us versus them. That's not entirely wrong. If the other party is, is absolutely committed to something that is a loathsome evil, you have to recognize that, there's, that there is a them over there. Okay? But on the other hand, we, it, 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 uh, the Republican Party is, is, not, is, is offering only sort of milksop opposition to the regime of, of abortion. It has had so many opportunities over the years. When, they, when uh, under the second President Bush, the Infants Born Alive Act was passed, it would have taken so, he, he signed it and said all the right things, the President, it would have taken so little to then require that it be enforced. It hasn't been enforced so that infants are still allowed to die in hospitals after they've already been born, okay, because of botched abortions and things like this. Um, it is shocking, and Republicans shouldn't, shouldn't feel very, very virtuous about being Republicans if, if that's what they're putting up with. So I think they have to start saying no to, no to that candidate, no to that kind of supine acquiescence in evil. You gave a few examples of recent presidents who you consider either thugs or bad men. Um, are there any recent presidents you can name who you consider to be virtuous men? Well, I, I, I would at least say I think that there, are some, that there are a few recent presidents who I wouldn't call bad men or thugs. But I, would, but I would say have, um, have failed, they performed less well than they should have given what seemed to be some of their virtues. I would say that, you know, that's the, impl that's the implication of what I was just saying about, about the second President Bush. I don't think he was a bad man at all. Um, but I don't understand why some of his virtues didn't have the power to fire his imagination to do some of the things that it was within the reach of his office to do. Um, I guess here the problem was not wickedness. It was just um, something missing from, from, uh, from a package of some rather decent virtues. And um, I'm not a utopian, I said that earlier, but I do think that we have to have aspirations. We, we ought to regard virtue as a heroic, uh, a heroic task, despite our own faults, and God knows, I've got many. You know, we have to, we have to, uh, we have to, to, to aim for heroic virtue. In a society like ours, where the, where the level of vice is now so great, the only virtue that even has much of a chance of surviving is heroic virtue. So I don't know if that answers your question or not. Did it sort of? How far back to a president who was definitely virtuous? <laughs> Lincoln? 
<laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know how far back I would go, partly because I don't remember all the presidents. <laughs> you know, when, I, when they used to test me in, in school, I was supposed to memorize the capitals of all 50 states. I just couldn't do it. You know, I can't remember the names of all of the presidents. When I was, uh, when my children were growing up, I used to call my daughters by the names of the cats. Uh, <laughs> I was, I was chatting about who had, a, who had a worse memory with one of my colleagues at the elevator, and he said, that's nothing. I used to call my, my kids by the names of the pets, too. I said, these were the dead cats. He said, you win. <laughs> so, so I don't know. I, I, can't, I can't take it step by step and say, here was a, re- a man of virtue. But I, 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 do, I do think that, yeah, Lincoln was, a, Lincoln was, was one of them. <laughs> he certainly was. Uh, not to say that I think that, er- that I approve of everything he did. <laughs> <laughs> a, a bit of a follow-up question of yes. sorts. Sure, they're all follow-ups in a way. <laughs> isn't it, but isn't it true that, that, or at least to some extent, that the, the American Republic, the Madisonian regime, is designed in such a way that we don't need virtuous men, right? Isn't that what Madison sort of at least argues in some respects in Federalist 10 and 51. No, I would say it's not at all what he says. That is a widely held view. It's even promulgated in various textbooks. And it was taught to me when I was first learning, learning political theory that Madison thought if, a proper, if you have a properly designed republic, you don't need virtuous men. What he did think, in fact, he insisted, especially at the Virginia Ratifying Convention, that if there wasn't enough virtue among the population, the chances for the republic were zero. And he said, but... I believe that we have that degree of virtue. There has to be that threshold that's satisfied. And he said he thought that we were over it. What I will say about his view of designing the Constitution is that he thought that by means of checks and balances, by pitting ambition against ambition, by all of these other things that are commonly viewed as eliminating the need for virtue, he didn't think that they eliminated the need for virtue, but they gave, they gave what little virtue there is a better chance of operating. They gave what little virtue there is a better chance of operating. It was like Hamburger Helper. Okay? Um, you, <laughs> or STP, or these gas treatments. You get a little, you pour it in your tank and you get a little more mileage, even though you don't have much gas. <laughs> um, uh, one of the places that's on display is in um, an essay that's often regarded as having nothing to do with virtue. That's Federalist Number 10. We, we say it's all about how factions will compete each other will compete with each other and so nobody will be able to get his bad way because each, each bad faction will stop the other bad factions who want some different bad thing from doing the bad thing they want so the, the common good will somehow magically result. He doesn't think that it's magic. He says in, the, he says in that essay, uh, we must recognize that enlightened, he means virtuous, men will not always be at the helm. But he doesn't say they'll never be at the helm and then he goes on to talk about ways in which you can get them to the helm more often. He may have been wrong about this that I'm about to say, but it was at least an effort to take a stab at the problem. He thought that electoral districts should be fairly large rather than very tiny. Why? Well, for several reasons. Number one, you had a better chance, he says so, of finding a sufficiently virtuous person. Okay? Given, given, let's say that virtuous people are only, sufficiently virtuous people to rule and to make laws are only... X percent of the population and not all of those would be willing to serve, then you've got to have a decent-sized community before you find one. Um, number two, he thought that, um, he thought that if, the, if, the, if the electoral district had to be large enough so that candidates would be unable to, to practice with success the vicious arts by which elections are too often carried, he meant you've got to have so many people that it's too expensive to bribe all of them at once. The principle here is that people are willing to vote for somebody who's more virtuous than they are, but it is not such a strong motive that they can't be tempted by, by a bribe or by some promise, some dishonest promise of something that you would do after you're elected. And so, um, yes, you need that, votive, that motive to be willing to vote for a good person. But you also want to try to clear its field of operation by making it less likely that the person will be seduced from the path of virtue by a bribe. And he thought that a little bit of political engineering could help there. I, I, I don't know if that, that's worked entirely, but um, I think he was thinking along the right lines. And that the, that the constitutional designer does have to think along those kinds of lines. It's an arms race, right? You think, I've made the electoral districts big enough so that nobody is rich enough to bribe all the voters? 
Well, then, of course, you invent political action committees, and, and you also invent the idea of bribing the voters by what you promise to do after you're elected instead of with what you're giving them now before they vote, uh, you know, through, through uh, benefits delivered by law. It, and, and then you have to think, okay, the bad side, the side of vice, has, has got one up. What can I do to counter that? And you're always working at it. Does that help? Okay. I have a quick question, if I yes. may. Yes. Um, about Amazing. How, <laughs> a moderator has a question. <laughs> about how uh, Christians should engage um, our, our current situation. I'm going to give you a, a very specific example and then kind of lay out two Christian responses that I've seen. Um, you mentioned before that sometimes we have to do battle. Yes. So um, there's one teacher who lost her job in a public school because she said that she couldn't um, encourage four- and five-year-olds to question their gender identity, so she lost her job because of this. And I've heard mm. Christian responses falling on two uh, extreme sides. On one side, they would say, let's get out there and um, be militant. You know, sometimes this militancy is angry. It's, this is sort of what you were talking mm -hmm. about before. On the other side, they say, out of loving Christian compassion, uh, let's just try to persuade um, these people not to you know, persecute this teacher because of her beliefs. And so mm -hmm. I know these are two extremes, but my overall question is, how then do we engage? How should we engage without losing our Christianity, mm -hmm. but engaging the battle when there is one to be okay. fought? Okay. Well, I think that there are several things. Although we don't ever want to become uncivil. Um, Fighting is not in itself uncivil. We have, to, we have to find civil ways of fighting. You know, you don't insult the other guy. You don't, uh, you don't call them names. You don't play dirty tricks. You don't, you don't hire private detectives to dig up dirt on them. But you oppose them by, by rational arguments, by, by appeals to the common sense of the voters, as hard as you can. And you use accurate language, which may sound insulting, but is not an insult, to say why what they propose is wrong. You can do that. You can do it without incivility. Um, I hear many people today saying, oh, Donald Trump is so refreshing because he battles political correctness. They're accepting the lie that to be politically correct is the same as being civil, right? And so that to be against political correctness is the same thing as being incivil, and that's, that's, that's a mistake. Uh, but I think we also have to recognize that the norms um, in political uh, discourse and how you argue there and the norms in persuading our friends are very different. Hmm. And they're also different than the norms that you would use if you're, um, if you're chatting with your Bible study group. And they're different than the norms that you use when you're, when you're at, a, at a family Thanksgiving dinner and somebody says something that seems way out to you. You, 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 you don't speak in the same way in all of these places. I'm not saying you ever speak in a rude and uncharitable way. Never. But the, the means that you do use to persuade are genuinely different in those contexts. Um, we also need to recognize, and this is not being uncivil, that, that um, when somebody poses an argument, not every argument is an authentic argument. You know, we find this in questions. Somebody says, says, well, how do I know that such and such is not true? Well, sometimes that's an honest intellectual question that requires an honest intellectual answer. But sometimes when somebody, when somebody poses an objection to something that seems to be moral common sense, uh, sometimes it isn't really honest. It's, um, it's uh, a way to avoid conversation or a way to try to trip you up with cleverness or something like this. When, sometimes people don't know that they're doing that. Sometimes there are ways of asking questions in such a way that, it, that the pattern of their responses reveals to them themselves that they're playing that kind of game. Do you follow me? I, I, um, I, uh, I was once talking to a young man who, uh, who, who um, it was about some moral proposition or theological proposition, and he had objection after objection after objection. But he tended to interrupt me whenever I cal calmly replied to each of his objections and said, well, I think that why I don't agree with that is this, he would, he would listen and t until just before the punchline and then interrupt and ask a different, uh, pose a different objection from a completely different direction. This was no longer honest intellectual questioning, you see. He was laying a smoke barrage. He was evading. So I said, do you notice a pattern in our conversation? And he said, no, what? And I, I have to say, he wasn't really a rude young man. Okay? He said, no, what, what is the pattern? I said, um, 
you've had a lot of objections, and that's fine. He said, yeah, I sure have. And I said, but every time I get to the, just as I'm about to deliver the punchline of one of my replies, you interrupt me. And he says, I guess I have done that. He said, why do you think I'm doing that? <laughs> and I said, well, why do you think you're doing that? And he said, I guess it's because I don't want to hear your replies. And I said, well, in that case, I think that what, what we really have to discuss is not these objections of yours, but why you don't want to hear the replies. That would be a more fruitful topic of a discussion. Now, sometimes we have to do that. That's not something it's very easy to do in politics because you've only got a nine-second so soundbite on the news. But, you know, you can do, sometimes you can achieve more in one-to-one uh, in -one conversations because these kinds of things are possible. And it also requires enough charity to stay in a relationship with the person. There are things that people can hear at some points in their life that they can't hear at another point in your life, and you've got to be there and ready, waiting for the opportunity. Thank you. Okay, we still have time. Hi. So does your analysis of sort of the grand errors of conservatism change or look different at all with the way that sort of the right wing generally is split up into more different sort of ideological factions today? I'm thinking of not only the, the left's charge of, you know, alt-right, but also of Trump and the sort of thuggishness that isn't quite that, and yeah. then of your sort of very religious factions versus sure. sort of very libertarian economic policies and that kind of leave me alone to do my own thing? Yes, I, I think I understand what you're asking. I would, I would uh, if, I was, um, if I was in a conversation with a social scientist about this, I would say, let's disaggregate. Some of these errors are more likely to be committed by this kind of liberal or by this kind of conservative, and some of these errors are more likely to be committed by this other kind. Uh, and you don't, you, know, you, you, you don't very often find somebody who is holding Seven out of eight of them. <laughs> Does that so? So, I think that's you're asking. Is that so? And I'm saying yes. <laughs> it, but you may be asking more than that. Well, I guess I was. I was kind of wondering. Does it change sort of your overall perspective on which errors conservatives are more prone to, or does it almost split it up into like separate? camps of errors. No, I don't think it changes my analysis of which ones they're more prone to. I, I, I simply would want to recognize, I just think this is realistic, that different kinds of conservatives are prone to more to different kinds of conservative errors and different liberals, different kinds of liberals to different kinds of liberal errors. Um, sometimes this has to do, sometimes there are theoretical reasons for this. Sometimes it's just social milieu reasons. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Uh, so, like, uh, <clears throat> your lecture was very pessimistic, but because I think you focus too much on the errors of both sides, but uh, I'd like to know if, do you think it's still possible to find, like, a common ground? If there is something like, for example, some right opinions from which, like, the left can learn, f learn, learn from the right and the l right can learn from oh, the sure. left? Yeah, first of all, I don't think I am a pessimist. Um, I, I, think I'm a, I think I'm a realist. I, I think that, I think that, um, we sometimes have the idea that in order to have hope, we have to not look at serious problems in the face. And we, and especially we Americans are like that. We, uh, we're pragmatic, we're, we're optimistic, we think that, that, you know, we approach things like engineers, we think that, we think that everything can be fixed and don't want to hear that there are any permanent problems of human life or anything like that. Uh, and I think that actually we, have, we, we stand a better chance of fixing what is fixable if we recognize how badly some things are broken. So I don't think I'm a pessimist. And I also do not think, just because things, many things look bleak right now, that everything is necessarily just going to go all to hell. Um, I, I, uh, I believe that humans have free will. I believe in the grace of God. And I don't believe in uh, determinism. Uh, and I don't, I don't, in other words, think that you can look at a graph line and simply project um, th that, um, that it's going to continue rising or continue falling or whatever. Now, your more specific uh, question had to do, say, state the second part of it again. Oh, yes, about sharing. I do think so. I, 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 I think on a few things, there, there, it is possible to build a common ground. There are, although the... The, the, the center of gravity of, um, of the left has tended to move 
uh, toward greater and greater restriction of free speech and less and less respect for it, less and less conviction that is even a value. There are many of the more old-fashioned liberals who still do believe in free speech. Um, there is an organization, the name of which I can't quite remember right now, that, battles for, that has been exi in existence for several decades, that battles for free speech in academia, that I believe was founded by a, by a liberal. But it, it, it achieves a lot of cooperation between liberals and conservatives who want authentic debate. And uh, that's, in, that's crucial in the classroom. People need to be exposed to different points of view. They can't be just snowflakes who are damaged by hearing anything that, they, uh, that, that isn't what they want to hear. Um, so there is an area where there, are, where there is some cooperation is possible. Um, it's difficult, though. It's difficult, though. And whenever there is an, an, an opportunity like that, it should be seized. It should be seized. And I'm glad you asked your question, because if that tended to get lost in my, in my talk, it needed to be emphasized. Um, please join me in thanking Dr. Budzicheski one more time. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. The din outside is being caused by students who are trying to get in here to take a quiz. Um, so <laughs> we do have to move ourselves out here rather quickly. Um, but Dr. Budzicheski will be here. You know they might prefer that we are in here so long that they don't have to take the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> they probably would. <laughs>